My story is about crisis, impasse, getting stuck, asking how did we get there, how can we get unstuck. It's about transforming the status quo when that status quo is being accepted by everyone as the only way of being. As a child, I felt stuck very many times. I started talking much later than usual, and I also had to operate in very many different countries because of my dad's job. So I had to adjust in four different educational systems, four different languages, but there was one thing that was constant in my life, and that one was my family. It had instilled me with a very silent but strong value. The fact that one can excel and at the same time do good to his own community, to his own people, to his own race. So when I became an economist, I decided to work for the World Bank because for me it was the ideal place. I could work as an economist with the rigor of my academics and at the same time, work in a professional way at a space where I was able to contribute to those in need, whether they were individuals or communities. I was assigned at the time to work for Latin America. I later worked with other countries as well, but I spent a, a, quite a while, quite a long time with Peru. Peru was a country that was um, completely in crisis. It had defaulted in its sovereign debt together with other Latin American countries, and it was going through its worst financial and economic instability ever. So we, as the World Bank, were helping uh, the country to come up in its feet, on its feet. So, but I wanted to get to know a little better that country, a country that was plagued with anomie, terrorism, kidnappings, car bombs, executions in the streets, and even the epidemic of cholera once. So I took a walk and a drive, actually, with some local friends of mine. I decided to drive outside the city and see some urban areas, outskirts of Lima. My local friends were with me. I asked them, what is it exactly the name of these areas? And they turned around and said, oh, we call them asientamentos humanos, human settlements. So I was rather surprised, human settlements. That's a pretty odd way of calling an urban area outside of the city. Anyway, I didn't pay much attention, I kept on driving, and I came across this sand dune, this desert-like area, completely overtaken by constructions, like this ones. The colors were faded with a slight dust, a red dirt. We sat with the residents, the leader of the community had the residents put together to communicate, to talk to us, to tell us exactly what did they feel would be necessary as a reform or as a policy that would help their lives, their individual lives and their communities to have a better impact. So we heard the usual, you know, we heard that they needed infrastructure, they needed running water, they needed roads, but there was something really consistent, systematic, that it was asked all the time. They needed security. They needed security over their own homes. They needed security over their own plots, over the rights of ownership of their homes. I will never forget this woman. She was um, weathered, late 20s, early 30s, three children around her, so she was a mother of three. She raised her hand and asked a question, and she said to us, um, is there a way I can get security for my house, although it does not have a roof? Oh my gosh, I, I turned around and asked my same friend, did I understand well or is my Spanish really bad? Uh, he said, oh no, of course you understood very well, this is very common, of course people don't have roofs. After all, these are informals. I said, what are they? Informals, informales. Informals. Informals, I thought, is probably an object or a characteristic that would be offered to an object, not to a human. So he saw this big question mark on my face and said, Eleanor, of course you don't understand. You're a Greek born in Europe, educated in America, and now you're telling me that you can understand human settlements, informals, and people living in homes without a roof. Well, good luck, it's not going to be possible, but I just couldn't, of course, let go, and I tried to understand what is it that makes these countries have such a huge proportion of them being informal. And how can it be that we, at, as World Bank at the time, 
or other organizations kept on intervening into countries to help them, to help their economics, yet this part was never touched. So I tried to understand what was really the situation, what, what is it to be informal, how does it look like, how does it feel like? It feels very much insecurity. They have limited or almost zero security, and especially over their ownership of their homes. As a result, they live in a philosophy which is different. The philosophy that is bred is the philosophy of survival, completely different from the philosophy of life of formal frameworks that are just a few kilometers away from them. And imagine in that specific space, when one feels very insecure about their home, they don't really want to let their home go. So they always have a kid or a child in that house. If they need to take a trip, or even better, they will build micro-businesses in the same house with the children being their labor, so that they would have both salary, you know, an income, and the house intact. But in bottom line, children would not go to school. So that did not only affect increase in child labor, but it was also impacting literacy levels, as well as preventative health, because vaccination programs are not knocking the door of anybody's house. They're all done in school, uh, school rooms. In addition to that, there was obviously haphazard growth of a city, and don't forget that we would have a very bad zoning system, so you would find agricultural, commercial, and residential properties all zoned in the same space. So I was wondering, is this just a Peruvian phenomenon? 25 million people, of which about 70% of their population were living under these conditions. It's not only a Peruvian problem. As a matter of fact, I'll break the news to you, it's a geographically boundless problem. It doesn't even define itself for developed countries to developing countries. It touches everything. It touches countries that could go all the way from the United States, New York, California. You can find it, of course, in Latin America, but you can also find it in Europe. You can also find it, of course, in the subcontinent, Philippines or India, or also in Africa. So the question is also, is there such a thing as formal, informal, a binary relationship? That's not the case. You can find a spectrum of informality that can start from the most poor areas, as the ones you see right now, to actually richer areas, like the ones you see right now, which are pictures from Europe or the United States. So I asked myself, as a good Greek, what makes this bloody informality? What, why do we have it? And the question has, was twofold. Informality is a result of consistent stumbling on huge bureaucracy. Processes that are overlapping, processes that are unclear, processes that are fighting with each other, Getting into a trip when you want to do a transaction and you want to do a formal transaction, whereby you don't know if you're ever going to end with that transaction or finish successfully. As a result, what you end up generating in the back of your mind is, there is no way I'm ever going to deal with these guys. I will operate on my own, on my own, in my informal environment. All these processes are for the formal people, let them do it. If they have money, they will hire a little guy that is going to go from you know, one process to the next. But we don't have money, so we won't do it. So as a result, we have two islands. We have the informal world in one island and the formal world in another island. And then a huge gap in between, which is defined by lack of trust. And the only time the formal is meeting the informal is usually with handouts and usually before elections. And it goes this way, from the formal to the informal. And you know what is the bottom line of that relationship? Cynicism. People end up believing that that's how it was, that's what it is, and that's what it will be. And that's called the reality on the ground. 
I won't tell you how many times I've traveled to countries to work with them and I would always hear, this is a Peruvian reality, you don't understand it. This is the Egyptian reality, you don't understand it. And this is a Filipino reality, you don't understand it. And I can go on and on and on and touch our own countries, which I'm sure they have their own level of their own realities. So we're getting into a situation where I was sitting there thinking, am I going to put myself in the camp of cynicism? Or am I going to give it a try? So since I'm here, I guess I gave it a try. So I did give it a try. So I went back to my economics and found all the fundamentals, land and labor, the two basic factors of production, the two basic elements of production. But land is super important because it has a dual consistency. Land is intimately related to us. We walk on it, I'm, I'm standing on it right now, and you're sitting on it over there. You drove over it. We fly over it. We fight over land. Land feeds us also, and we get buried in it. The distinction is, if you're in the formal world, you assume it, you take it for granted. If you're in the informal world, you really fight. You really fight so you don't have half an inch pulled away from you. And land is also an economic and a social aspect, a asset. It has, in other words, it, it can be shelter, and it, at the same time, it can, be used as a, it can be used as an investment. So I decided to go back and simplify all processes. And I thought the best way to do a, a simplification of processes is to actually go from the bottom to the top. So I worked with those people in the field because it's these people that are going to use these processes. So they had to feel that they were part of this. They felt secure and they had to start trusting. They had to start trusting that this new system is actually something that is partnering with government and is there to provide them with a benefit. Amazing. But what is even more amazing is that it took over seven years to move from that definition of that startup reform, if you want to call it, to actually applying it full blown nationwide to Peru. Seven bloody years. Why? Vested interests, rent seekers, traditional policymakers, and traditional academics. All of us thought, well, yeah, sure, formal is a good thing, but we don't really know if that can work, and it's taking a long time, and it's very sensitive. And don't forget, that's how it was, and that's how it is, and that's how it's going to be, so don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to change. Seven bloody years. And what kept me going was the fact that every single moment I was seeing these people thinking, these years is holding back the actual welfare of so many people out there. 70% of the world's population lives on informal land. Four billion people. It translates to nine trillion US dollars, twice the money supply of the United States, all over the world. And we were sitting out there, you know, figuring out whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing to actually apply this reform, which we finally did. And you know what was the amazing result? Three years into the reform, six million people transformed their properties into formal properties. They became proud members of the middle class. And today, as we speak, it's more than 10 million people that are part of this formal middle class. And then I sat back and thought, what is really, right now, the next step? We had a social and economic baseline, as well as a cost-benefit analysis to measure, to measure exactly these changes. We found out that child labor was reduced by 20-some percent. Women's involvement was increased by 50 percent. People's, people's security was doubled. But most importantly, do you know what really was the most important return? Governments. The government had invested $60 million for this change, and it received, as a return, $1.7 billion in return. 200 multiple of that investment that was taking seven years to get the nay and do it. So as I was thinking, what is really the next good thing to do? As you see, these wonderful changes of that same commit committee, I'm sorry, community that I went to. 
no longer called a human settlement. So what was the next thing to do? The next thing to do was a discussion with myself. I asked myself, is it really a conversation between being formal and being informal, what we really need to be spending time about? Or really spreading the, world, the word that transformation is possible. It's a fact. It happened. It is happening. But for that to happen, you need to create a new framework because the old framework is too traditional, it's too old, it's too rigid. The new framework is to be there and develop alignments between and positive synergies between the citizens, the government, the private stakeholders, and build on trust. So I committed myself to build that framework and promote that framework with putting myself at the risk of stepping out of my comfort zone, of the comfort zone of my entire life and got into developing a method called reality check analysis. And that analysis, that methodology is developing is diagnosing informality in different parts of the world, because as I said, they're different, so you can tailor the transformation in different ways. Wrote a book called Prosperity Unbound, so I would be able to witness on that piece of paper, the A to Z, how does it happen, how can it happen, as well as failure stories. Life is not all success stories, right? And then I developed a think and action community around my work. I became a social entrepreneur, created an NGO called Panel Group Thought for Action, and concentrated a lot in working in more than 30 countries on the social aspects of secure property rights, on the aspects of peace negotiations and post-conflict countries. So the question that came back again to my mind, and I think it's really worth sharing it with you, is when you are confronted with an impasse, what should you do? I would suggest strongly not to get afraid. Really confront that impasse. Get inspired by the fact that once you break it, you're getting into a totally new world with so much more positive energy that will incorporate and enroll so many more people, not just you. I didn't do this reform on my own. I did this reform with everybody else. Yes, I was there in the beginning. I was a stubborn Greek, and I was saying, I'm going to get to understand informality. But I got into being enrolled and myself involved in this positive energy of the possibility of transformation. And every time I would want to stop, every time I wanted to go back into my cynical world, because it's more comfortable. It's always easier to be cynical. Every single time I had these people come and t pull me back in, they were the ones keep me, helping me to keep going. So I would like to ask you tonight to not resign into the cynicism, because it's easy. But go back, look around all sorts of informality that exists, and act, engage yourself, and figure out ways that you can partner with government, with private stakeholders, with your fellow citizens, in the ways that you could change or make a change. As small as it is, it's a change. That was my story. Thank you very much.